Welcome back, everyone. So last class, we started the chapter on memory, and we learned about the different kinds of memory and how psychologists study retention of memory. And there's three main ways, recall, recognition, and relearning. So what do we know about forgetting? Kind of complicated because if somebody can't recall something, does that mean that they fail to encode the information? Does it mean that they failed to... Hi, mom. Thank you. That's my mom. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so if somebody can't remember something, um, is it because they failed to encode it? Or is it because somehow the memory trace, memory trace is a metaphor that we use to describe however a memory is physically stored. Is it because that decayed in storage? Or is it because they, or did they encode it and store it and then just fail to retrieve it. So different things could be going on with forgetting. Retrieval failure happens when we know the information, it's stored in our memory, but we can't pull it out. We can't recall it. And you've probably experienced this on an exam, maybe with a fill in the blank question. I recall it happening to me in, in grade 12 biology. I studied, I studied really, really hard for, um, for the final exam. And I memorized all the parts of the crayfish and, and I had to fill in the blanks on a diagram and they wanted to know what, what these snappers were called. And I had learned it and it was driving me crazy. I just, I just couldn't pull it out. And uh, I, I gave up. And I remember later on uh, when I was, I think maybe helping clean up the lab, it just suddenly came back to me, celliped. And I have never forgotten it since. That's a celliped. But I couldn't, I couldn't get it out, get the information out when I was on my exam. And that's called the tip of the tongue phenomenon. And when people believe this is happening, they seem to be right that they know the information and you can get it out if uh, they're given a retrieval cue, some kind of a hint. So another, um, I'm recording. Sorry about that. <laughs> so another, uh, that really threw me off. <laughs> Something else we know from research in psychology is that you're more likely to remember information, more likely to be able to recall it if you learned it over longer periods of time, right? If you spread out studying versus if you try to cram it in all at once. Okay, so studying information in small increments over a large amount of time, it's called distributed practice, is much more effective than studying um, large increments over a brief amount of time. It's called mass practice. That's what you do when you stay up all night to read all the chapters right before the midterm. It's one of the most replicated effects in all of psychology. You cram because you put yourself on a negative reinforcement schedule. So avoiding and procrastinating is negatively reinforced behavior because it helps you escape your anxiety and distress and dislike of studying. Then the day before the exam, right, you start to cram and that's negatively reinforced because 
now the act of studying helps you escape your anxiety and distress over the thought of likely failing the exam. You have the agency to change the reinforcement schedule. Okay? You could put yourself on, on a positive reinforcement schedule instead of that not so great negative reinforcement schedule. So you decide to start studying earlier and chunk things out into smaller pieces, you know, maybe half hour study sessions. And then you might find yourself actually enjoying working on it. You've allowed yourself time to enjoy it. And you're encountering the, the material when you can be relaxed. And you might feel good about that and do it again. And then you'll do well on your test and feel good about that too. And that will encourage you to keep distributing your practice. We are more likely to remember information when the conditions, when the environmental context at the time of encoding are also present at retrieval. There are two kinds, context-dependent learning and state-dependent learning. Context-dependent learning describes superior retrieval when the encoding context matches the retrieval context. So if you learn some, sorry, there's a, a study on divers where they asked divers to learn something underwater or on land, and they tested their recall underwater or on land, and they were more likely to remember what they had learned underwater when they were tested underwater. Let me get my laser pointer out here. So on the graph here, it says um, recalled on land. And it shows uh, two lines here that the red is, sorry, the blue is encoded on land and the red is encoded underwater. And you can see that when they, uh, when they learn something on land, they're more likely to remember it when they're tested on land. And when they learn something underwater, they're more likely to remember it when they're tested underwater. How would we apply this to, to your life? Well, if you learn something in a classroom, there's a, it's, it's a small effect. This here looks like a, a large effect, um, but you're more likely to remember it if you get the test in the classroom. So if you know, where you're going to be tested, it would be great if you could also study in that same location. In this course, you have online exams, so it would be best to take your online exam in the same place that you studied the material and attended these lectures. Then there's state dependent learning. We're more likely to recall information that was encoded when we were in the same psychological or physiological state at the time of encoding as at the time of retrieval. And what that means is, um, if you are, if somebody gets drunk and loses their keys, they might have to get drunk again to remember where they lost their, where they put their keys. If you are feeling sad or angry, you're more likely to think of events in the past that made you feel sad or angry. But if you're feeling happy, um, happy things that happen to you are more likely to pop into your head. We know very broadly that 
memories are physically stored somehow, somewhere. The metaphor for that is a memory trace. But nobody's ever seen a memory trace. Okay? We know very little about this. There isn't one place where all the memories are stored. Uh, we know that from animal research. There was a researcher who wanted to know where a mat, where a rat's memory for a maze is stored, and so he he lesioned all these different parts of the rat's brain, poor little rat, um, and no matter where he lesioned the brain, the rat still remembered something about the maze. So it seems like there wasn't one place where the memory was stored. So it seems that they're stored diffusely in multiple networks. That said, there is some evidence for localization of function as well. Okay, there are some brain structures that, um, that we know have a role in, in memory, memory consolidation or memory retrieval, or in transferring short-term memories into long-term memory. So we know that the hippocampi, remember you have two, one on either side, have a role in long-term memory encoding and retrieval. We know this because people who have had their hippocampi damaged have problems with their long-term memory. We know that the amygdala have a role in emotional memory. Okay, memories that are associated with strong feelings somehow engage the amygdala. We know this because people who have damage to their amygdala can recall something factually, but without the feeling. And we know that the basal ganglia and the cerebellum have a role in episodic memory. Your episodic memory refers to your memory for the events in your life, like what you did yesterday your, or your 19th birthday party. And the basal ganglia is involved in the initiation of, of voluntary acts, and the cerebellum has to do with your physical coordination around that. They're also involved in, in memory for those actions. We know a little bit about um, memory at the neural level. We can observe something called long-term potentiation at the level of individual neurons. And it refers to the strengthening of connections between neurons that fire together when they're repeatedly stimulated, sorry, when there is repeated stimulation of some kind. So a stimulus is applied, it causes one neuron to connect to another. And if you keep repeating that stimulus, then that um, connection can get strengthened. That's called long-term potentiation. And it's behind the saying, neurons that fire together, wire together. This has a role in, in learning, like in learning associations um, between say like salivation and a tone and, and salivation because the tone is, is paired with, with food. And what's going on here, so here's a picture of a normal or, or a neuron before long-term potentiation. And then here's a picture of the potentiated neuron. And you can see that more neurotransmitter is being produced and released, and there's more receptors 
for those neurotransmitters. Now you've probably seen some movies or TV shows that show people losing their memory. That's, that's called amnesia. And it's used as, as a trope often in stories. So one day somebody hits their head and they have total retrograde amnesia. They don't know who they are. They don't remember anyone or anything. And then one day they get better and they remember it all. Uh, it doesn't really work like that. So amnesia does often occur following some kind of an injury. No, I, I don't want to give you the impression that injuries are likely to lead to amnesia. When, am, when amnesia happens, it's likely that some injury was involved. And um, it's not likely to happen after every injury. And it's not like you're going to forget everything like they do in the movies. And it, it's also unlikely that um, you'd recover all your memories again. So in many cases, it's like the memory loss is partial and the memory recovery could be partial or even absent. Like sometimes people never recover memories. The most common types of amnesia are retrograde. That refers to loss of past memories. An example would be in Alzheimer's disease or dementia, where people come to like forget their their life histories and, and forget who their family members are. And then there's anterograde amnesia, which refers to the loss of ability to make new memories. So somebody with anterograde amnesia, and we'll take a look at um, a case today, might be able to remember their their past, let's say before the injury or the illness, right? Assuming that they don't also have retrograde amnesia. So let's say there's no retrograde amnesia. They can remember everything from before the injury. Well, they might not be able to make, they wouldn't be able to make new memories after the injury. And so what that would look like is that they would, sorry, I'm talking about long-term memory here. They might have their uh, sensory memory and their short-term memory, but they don't put any of those short-term memories into long-term memory, or if they do, they can't pull it out again. And it might be like they're constantly, feeling like they're constantly waking up again after the injury, like every 30 seconds or so. There are a couple of famous examples of patients with anterograde amnesia. One of them is HM and the other one is uh, Clive Waring. HM was known by those initials for during his lifetime. Um, he's in many intro psych textbooks, many papers were written about him and he was known as patient HM. Um, he passed away fairly recently and his name was disclosed. So it was Henry Molaison. And he had severe epilepsy. And back in, it was probably the 50s, they used to use um, much more aggressive treatments and uh, do brain surgery. Nowadays, we'd have, there'd be medications to control that or much safer physical procedures. But uh, what happened to him was that they removed chunks of his temporal lobes. Uh, they removed both hippocampi. They're just gone, obliterated. But what this means is that when studying his behavior and the deficits in his memory, is it because of something to do with hippocampi or is it because of something to do with the temporal lobe? Not quite sure. But what's important here is that both um, hippocampi are gone. And he experienced uh, mild retrograde amnesia, but he had most of his memory for his life before the surgery. But he had severe anterograde amnesia. Okay? He couldn't form new long-term memories. And so if you were, say, walked into his room, introduced yourself, maybe you could have a little chat. If you walked out of the room and came back in, well, then he thinks he's meeting you for the first time again. 
And he would be very surprised to look in the mirror and see that his face had aged. Uh, he had a an uncle that he was very close to. And at some point, his uncle passed away and he'd regularly ask about his uncle. And when he was told that his uncle died, he would go through the, the shock and the grief, right, over and over again, because he was hearing that for the first time. Every time he heard it. So while he couldn't learn new episodic or semantic information, he could learn some skills. He was asked to trace a figure looking at it in the mirror. That's quite hard to do. And his speed um, at, at doing it, speed and accuracy at doing, increased a lot over three days, over a number of trials. That shows that he's remembering something. And if you'll recall, long-term memory is divided into proceed sorry into the explicit declarative memories like episodic memory and semantic memory and then into the implicit memories and implicit memory long-term memory includes your memory for priming for habituation for classically condition sorry for classical conditioning and what else is in there i can't quite recall there are about um or five things. Oh, yes. And your procedural memory. So you like your memory to for riding a bike or mirror tracing. So he still had that. And what that tells you is that the implicit memories are stored somewhere else because they seem to be not affected or minimal, minimally affected, but that the hippocampi possibly parts of the temporal lobe are very important for the um, explicit declarative memory. Um, patients like this might not be, wouldn't be able to tell you where the bathroom is on the ward. Like if you ask them, where is the, what are the directions to the bathroom? They couldn't produce that semantic information. They couldn't produce that in information from their semantic memory which is your memory for facts but if they needed to go to the bathroom they're able to get up and find it because your memory for spatial location is also implicit live wearing was is he's still alive that's why i i started to said is um he was a musician and then he had a, sorry, I don't like the way I'm saying that because I think he's still a musician. He can still play music. He was a professional musician. There you go. And then he had a virus. He got sick and the virus got to his brain and it destroyed his hippocampi. And that resulted in complete anterograde amnesia. He has enough, sorry, I think someone has their microphone on. I'm just gonna mute that. There we go. Okay, back to Clive Waring. So Clive Waring, had I don't know how much of his previous memory he uh, he kept, but he does know that he is a musician and that his that he has a wife named Deborah, and he knows that he has children. Okay, so he hasn't lost all his all the memory for things that happened before he got sick right he knew he had an illness but he has complete anterograde amnesia meaning that from his subjective consciousness he feels like he's waking up every 30 seconds remember that your working memory can last for about you know five seconds to, to 30 seconds 
and then your attention is going to shift. And if you haven't taken that information from the short-term memory and put it into long-term memory, poof, it's just gone. So for 20, more than 20 years, he's been keeping uh, a diary and the diary entries are always the same. So he has a time like 7.41 a.m. And he's like, I awake for the first time. You know, and then, then a minute later, he's like, I'm I'm really awake. Um, and then a few minutes like I'm I am truly awake for the first time. And he feels like he's just um awoken from from a coma. And now I'll uh, show you a brief video about Clive wearing. And for those of you who are watching the recording, you're not going to be able to see the video. It's going to look frozen because Teams just won't record a video within a Teams meeting. But what I will do is I will put a, a card in the recording where you can click the link to watch it. So I'll play that now. Let me know if you can't hear. So the the documentary, uh, which you can watch on um, YouTube, is called The Man with with No Memory. But it, it's not. Is it accurate to say that he has no memory? What's wrong with his memory? What's going on there? What's the role of the hippocampus in, in memory? It's obvious that he does have some memory. He knows how to play the piano. Um, there's a comment in the chat. Can we say he has delayed memory? By delayed memory, are you trying to say long? I'm not sure what you mean by, by delayed memory. What's the problem with his memory? Yeah, and I see a, a comment there um, from Chloe. I'm a bit confused as to why they keep asking him to guess everything when it'll make him more confused and forget the, forget the original thought. Um, he used to get very upset by this, this kind of questioning, and they're doing it for the documentary so that you can see the issues with, with his memory. And Emily says he has long-term memory. And how do you know he has long-term memory? Yeah, he was happy to see his wife. So he knows who she is. She also mentions his sister, Adele. He knows he has kids and that, you know, at least 20 years ago, they were writing their O-levels, which is um, some kind of, you know, it's like the British version of the SAT test, maybe. You do it at the end of high school. Yes. Yeah, so he can, he knows who his family is. He knows how to play a piano. I don't know much more about his his long term memory, but what's what's the problem with his long term memory now? So he has some long term memory. From before his illness. What's what's happening now? Interesting question from Charmaine. How does he remember that he feels like he's waking up every 30 seconds? So every 
very frequently he has the impression that he has just come out of a coma. And then he shifts his attention and feels like he's coming out of the coma again. And that's what his diary is full of entry after entry. But you could distract him and give him a cup of coffee and then he won't write, write something in his diary and he might he might make him think of something else. But then he'll go back to feeling like he just woke up. And this is the first you're the first person that that he's seen or his wife is the first person that he's seen you know, after coming out of this this coma. So he believes that he's been in, in a coma. Like, he seems to know that there's this void behind him. And the hippocampus has a role in consolidation of long-term memories and taking information from short-term memory and saving it in, in long-term memory and also in pulling it out of long-term memory again. And in this case, I don't really know, is it that it's going into the long-term memory and being encoded and then just not being stored or retrieved, or is it being encoded and stored and, and you can't retrieve it, or is it just never going into long-term memory at all? Um, there's a question would reading his diary make him remember things he would what he does is is cross out the entry before the new one because he it confuses him then he makes a new one saying i am really truly superlatively properly awake for the first time and and keeps doing that So, um, so you can see that he still has his implicit memory. I imagine that something that he and his wife could do together might be like learn to dance together, learn some ballroom dance, because he still has his uh, implicit memory and, and he'd probably be able to, to learn to dance better and better. Maybe that could be a thing that they could do. Just thinking of, of that. Um, the hippocampus plays a crucial sorry, crucial role in neural systems for long-term memory, but it has little, if any, role in the short-term retention of some types of stimuli. So he, his short-term memory seems to be working, but that reboots every 30 seconds or less. And obviously he has his procedural memory um, and he still shows priming effects probably classically condition him. And he has long-term memory for events before the illness. And you can see that he has a semantic memory for words because he's able to speak, right? He retained his vocabulary. So sleep is important for the hippocampus and its job in moving information between short-term and long-term memory. So remember that next time you stay up all night to cram for exam, because that sleep deprivation will interfere with your ability to store that new information that you're reading in long-term memory. And It'll interfere with your ability to pull anything at all that you studied before out of your long-term memory. So you can do yourself more harm than good by staying up all night before a test. Might be better to just get the sleep. We know from case studies of people with different kinds of brain damage that the hippocampus is involved in recalling events. So if the hippocampus is damaged, people can't recall the event, but they still feel the emotion that was associated with the event. They couldn't tell you what the event was, but if it was something scary, then they feel scared. But if the amygdala is damaged and the hippocampi are intact, then people could tell you about the event, but they wouldn't feel the emotion associated with it. Emotional memories involve some role 
of the neurotransmitter adrenaline. There is a role of adrenaline in the formation of traumatic memories. There is evidence that if people are treated after an event or um, with a beta blocker called propranol, it seems that they may not develop a traumatic memory. Propranol is a beta blocker, so it would block the effects of adrenaline. It's an, an anxiety reliever. That said, there are other ways to relax and engage your parasympathetic nervous system besides using propranol. So what's the take home point? Um, if something bad happens to you and, and you're in shock, we do what you can to to relax instead of. But people who go through some traumatic event get like really wired up about it because they're scared, right? That's that's the way trauma works, okay? But being in that fight or flight state predisposes you to end up with traumatic memories of that event. I saw another question in the chat about uh, Clive Waring. Would reading his diary make him remember things? No, he'd be, if he read his diary, he would read what was in front of him. And then as his attention shifted to the next line, forget what he just read. Uh, back to emotions and memory. Smell and taste are processed in the midbrain, which is also where your hippocampi and amygdala are. That's part of the evolutionary older part of the brain. Right. Odor is, is very important to to other mammals. You see that with your dog. And so. An, an odor can that, that reminds you of, of something that happened to you. It can bring feelings flooding back to you. And if you encoded memories while being exposed to some some odor, um, just smelling that smell again can bring all those memories back to you. So there's some association between odor and memory and also with with the feelings associated with that memory. And a few weeks ago, there was a, a question from someone in the class about uh, olfactory hallucinations. And I had. I was hearing about those for the first time and, uh, and I went and looked at more and read about it and it does seem to be a thing. So um, people who have anxiety, who have traumatic memories may even hallucinate the odor associated with those memories. So memory changes over time and we all have amnesia for our early lives. Think about your first memory ever. What's the furthest back you can remember in your life? For me, I'm three years old and engaging with my dad in the house we used to live in then. I have like maybe two of those memories and a third memory being in the kitchen but it was three i don't remember being two or being one or being six months old that's called infantile amnesia and it refers to the inability of adults to retrieve accurate memories from before the age of about three the upper lower limit on that seems to be two 
The hippocampus is only partially developed in infants. So maybe it's something about that. But then they're also don't have a sense of self developed yet either. And episodic memories are your memories about yourself. So that could be part of it too. There is no evidence for the use of, you know, hypnotic age regression or other therapeutic techniques to get around that limitation. Children's memories get better as they get older. And as they get older, they also have a better understanding of their own memory and its limitations. So a younger child might be more overconfident that they can remember things or they have a very good memory. But an older child who actually has the better memory is more aware of the limitations of their memory and of how they forget. So they have better meta memory skills. Young adults have the best long term memory and it goes downhill from there. Seems that uh, long term memories that are formed earlier on seem to stick better. So your grandpa might not remember what happened yesterday, but he could tell you all about when he was boy. So memory does deteriorate, especially in later life. In, as people get older, there's an increased risk of developing dementia, where we see severe memory deficits. But dementia is a process that goes beyond normal aging. And it is, in fact, possible for genetic reasons for younger people to get dementia. I think the youngest case of Alzheimer's disease is in a teenager in China. So dementia and old age aren't, and, and memory loss associated with the old age aren't the same thing, but there's a much higher chance of developing dementia in old age. The most frequent cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, has something to do with the loss of cholinergic neurons. And um, folks with dementia show memory loss. Uh, we can have severe retrograde amnesia to the point that they forget about their lives and they no longer recognize uh, their, their own relatives. So it can be a, a very emotionally distressing experience for the family. And I imagine that since it's so common that there's many of you that, that have had relatives with Alzheimer's disease. Research shows that those with active lifestyles are less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. But there's there's so much that that we don't know about Alzheimer's disease. We know some things. We know there's some role for the damage of and the loss of cholinergic neurons. Those are neurons that produce acetylcholine. But it's not as simple as that, because if that were the case, then the cure would just be to supplement acetylcholine or use an acetylcholine re-up and reuptake inhibitor. And while that is part of the treatment uh, for Alzheimer's disease, it doesn't, it doesn't stop it. Okay, so there's more going on. Medication to treat Alzheimer's disease is more about managing the symptoms, like people's you know, like agitation, for instance. However, I'm not aware of any effective disease modifying drugs. A disease modifying drug is a drug that would change the, the course of the illness, that would stop it from progressing. Right? There are disease modifying drugs for multiple sclerosis that help prevent it from, 
from developing. Um, so while there is research showing that those with active lifestyles are less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease, we're not really sure why that is. And we can't say, okay, stay really intellectually engaged and physically active and you won't develop Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So the, the use it or lose it theory feels sort of attractive, but it's difficult, difficult to prove, right? So there's only correlational relationships that we're aware of, right? Not, we don't have any causal evidence that um, exercise and cognitive engagement prevent Alzheimer's disease. That said, what else do you want to do with your life, right? It, and, and we know that there's so many other benefits to exercise, right? even with like with stress, with depression, with heart health. So I think we have enough evidence from other areas to say that, you know, exercising every day is, is definitely worth it. Like maybe it won't prevent Alzheimer's disease, but it would certainly um, help prevent uh, many other chronic health conditions. So it's worth it anyway. When I was uh, looking into this, I, I found that there was, in the United States, there's now a disease modifying medication approved to treat Alzheimer's called aducanubab. Aducanub, I can't even say it. Uh, but, and it's uh, an antibody, it's an immunotherapy that targets the protein um, beta am amyloid. Part of the Alzheimer's brain shows plaques, amyloid protein plaques. They're brain lesions that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. And so there was um, a lot of hope over this drug, but uh, it didn't pass the tests with Health Canada. So it has not been approved in Canada and there's some controversy around it. That brings us to uh, 1019 and um, I'll stop the recording there and we'll pick up next class with false memories. Oh, thank you for your attention. Have a good one. Thank you.